this is Joel and in this video we'll talk about DMVPN okay um, we're going to use DMVPN in an interesting way where we are trying to tunnel IPv6 traffic over IPv4 we have already looked about DMVPN uh, a pure IPv4 setup in my earlier videos you can go and check on the channel but back then I used EHRP as the protocol for the tunnels but in this video we'll obviously use OSPF just for a change cool that being said uh, also this is kind of like a continuation of the discussion what we have been having right we have looked at various ways various ipv6 transition technologies we have looked at uh, the so-called six to four tunnels isotap tunnels gre ipv6 ip and so on right so those tunnels in the previous video so in this one we'll look at a more feasible widely popular way of connecting your ipv6 right whatever is colored in red over here that's kind of like your IPv6 enabled devices and networks whereas whatever you have in the center over here is purely IPv4 so we are trying to see how we can get the IPv6 connectivity running between all these three sites by tunneling it over a IPv4 network cool that being said let's try to put something on the board here and discuss a bit of theory before we get to the configuration okay grab my pen so there are a few terms which you need to be familiar before we jump into the whole dmvpn right things why the very first question should be how did dmvpn even come into existence right so back in the day we had the whole gre concept right your gre the problem with gre is that it's a point-to-point -point tunnel which means you can't like really set up one tunnel between more than two sites right and when the number of sites increases the number of tunnels increases taking care of all those tunnels configuring too much hassle so that's why they came up with mgre in the mgre what is the advantage you can have one tunnel right but it need not be spent with, uh, or created between just two endpoints or be between two you know sites you can now have one tunnel which will span across multiple sites but again the disadvantage here would be that i mean if you're using a plain vanilla mgre tunnel you have to literally take care of all the configurations right so here in this example you know i'll probably have to go on r4 and i'll have to configure that look if you want to talk to r1 this will be the ip address which you need to form the tunnel with if you want to talk with r5 then this is the ip address you need to tunnel with so all that configuration one by one you need to put it on r4 really not that efficient right that's why we have what we are discussing today which is the dmvpn setup it, it's basically a, think of it as a you know next next gen version of mgre i mean you still use mgre tunnels inside dmvpn but in addition to that we have a very interesting protocol let me get rid of everything called as nhrp right so this nhrp protocol when worked when it works in conjunction with what your gre multi-point tunnels mgre tunnels it really blows everything's really really you know uh, perfectly okay so just to talk a little bit about this nhrp protocol right so nothing but next hop resolution protocol what it really does what in basic terms what it really does is so you have think of this as a spoke right you have a spoke here you have another spoke and you have a headquarters here okay so think of forget about this whole you know for a minute uh, how do you end up the connect how do you bring up the connectivity between all the sites because that is what we will learn in dmvpn but from an NHRP perspective, right? I mean, NHRP is an independent protocol. It existed even before DMVPN, right? How does it really work? Is that think of this way? So think of a tunnel between R4 and R1. What are the constituent? What are the various attributes of this tunnel, right? Which you can think of. The tunnel will have an IP address. Let's give some random IP address, saying 192.168.1.1, 1 .1, right on this side, and here it will be 1.2 then you will also have some kind of a public ip at, at this end right think of that public ip as 1.1.1 just an example on this side think of the public ip as 2. Dot, uh, sorry uh, probably uh, yeah think of something else right 2.2.2 .2 .2 .2. just an example they are not directly connected see they are uh, the public ip here has no influence on the public ip here right it's 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 basically a core network right so they need not be in the same network anyway 
So you have a public IP here, public IP here, and you have a private IP, private IP. So whatever you have on the top here, that's your tunnel IP address. And then you, whatever you have here in the bottom, they will be used as the outer header when the packet is going through this tunnel. Correct? How does the tunnel packet looks like? So you will basically have something like this, right? You will have uh, one, two, three, four. Okay? I'm not drawing the payload. Forget the payload. I'm just drawing the header. So you will have this um, uh, inside, the inside header, right? The source and the destination. This will be the source and destination of the actual packet, right? Which will basically be something like the private address if the packet is going on the tunnel. What will be on the outside? That is the outer header. And the outer header will always have IP addresses that can be understood by the underlay network like an internet. So here in, my, in our case, the blue box, sorry, the yellow box which you see here, that's the internet. So the outer header will have these addresses, 1.1.1, 2.2.2 over here. Right? So that's the outer header and this is the inner header. Just wanted to clarify that out. And that's how the packet actually goes in a tunnel. Now NHRP, what it really does is, to get around this whole, you know, hassle of having to manually configure all this information on the router in case of MGRE tunnels, when you use NHRP, the spokes, right, or basically the clients, in, in case of NHRP protocol, there is nothing like hub and spoke. We, we call the only terminology which exists is server and clients. So let me get rid of everything. So you will have like a server, you will have a client, okay. And how this really works is when the client comes up, it will go and register with the server. It's going to say, hey, look, I'm R4. This is my public IP address, right? To So that you can reach me at any point of time. And this is my tunnel IP address, right? So that mapping, which we saw here earlier, right? 192, 168, 1.1 and 1.1.1. So that mapping will be sent to the server, to the NHRP server, right? That's, that's it. I mean, the the information is sent there and so that and all the other clients also will do the same so this guy also will send the information up why we do that because we want to make this server very intelligent so that at any point of time say this guy wants to talk to here right he can quickly query the server asking the information right so the spoke so client which is here on the left side r4 can quickly query our nhrp server right and you can say, hey, look, I want to talk to R5. Can you give me the information about R5? And once I get the information about R5, I can kind of like form the tunnel and talk to him, right? So that's the main protocol which basically rules this whole DMVPN technology. So that being said, so we are good with that part. We talked about GRE, MGRE, DMVPN, and the main protocol, which is the NHRP protocol, phase one. So in phase one, let me grab my pen. So in phase one, what do we have? There are not going to be any spoke to spoke tunnels, right? Which means whatever you see here, this will be point to point. This will be point to point. Only on the other side, which is the hub, this is our hub. Only on here, you will see the MGRE tunnel, which is the multi point tunnel. Multi point GRE. Because as you see from R1, it has to form adjacencies with two tunnel or two um, sites, right? In this case, it can be any number of sites. That's why you have MGRE on the other side and point to point on the other two sides. Okay. So uh, as usual, like I explained the NHRP part, that really happens. What I mean is when the um, clients come up, they're gonna quickly go and register with the hub. They're gonna say, hey, look, I'm up. You know, they're gonna just go and give their information. They're gonna go and register, right? Uh, and they're, what, what information they're going to give to the hub or to the NHRP server, they're going to say, they're going to tell that this is their tunnel public IP and the private IP, right? So the tunnel IP which is over here, they're going to give that to the NHRP server. Both of them are going to do that. So our NHRP server or the hub which, which is sitting there in the center will have all the reachability information, okay? Similarly, all the net, all the OSPF adjacency, right? So we are going to be running OSPF. So where is the OSPF going to be running? Let me get rid of that just to show you that part. So OSPF will be running like this. So this is the tunnel. I'm talking about the IPv6 OSPF, right? There is 
and IGP running in the IPv4 cloud which we are not very concerned about that IGP is obviously running between R1, R2, R2 and R3, R3, R4 and R4, R5 plain vanilla OSPF but that's IPv4 OSPF forget that for a minute that's just giving you connectivity between inside your ISP cloud what we are talking about is the IPv6 OSPF the one which will be running over the tunnels which will which is the reason why we are doing this so we will have OS, IPv6 OSPF here running between R4 and R6 or sorry switch 2 we will have between R5 and uh, R6 and we'll also have it here between switch 1 and R1 and these tunnels the tunnels which are going to be set up here right the P2P tunnel here P2P and the MGRE so on that tunnel also we are going to have this OSPF right now you can see how that end-to-end -end connectivity is going to be established right so because we are setting up this tunnel over that tunnel we are setting up the OSPF adjacency and as a result switch sitting here will be able to talk to switch 2 or R6 and it will be able to talk what via IPv6 okay so all the IPv6 data which comes at R1 it will get encapsulated in IPv4 packet because of DMVPN and it will be sent down to say R4 or R5 or all the traffic coming from here R4 right will be sent upwards to R1 and then to R5 because it is phase 1 all the traffic will always go through the hub right the reason anyone ask you that the reason is because the tunnels the way you're setting up the tunnels it is point to point so as a result there is no way r4 can directly talk to r5 i mean unless you are bypassing the tunnel and going directly right but via the tunnel it is no way possible to set up a tunnel because it's a point to point tunnel point to point tunnel the meaning of point to point is that you can set it up between only two endpoints so that is why all the traffic coming from say switch to destined to r6 can't directly go through R3 rather it has to go to the other side of the tunnel which is R1 always because it is point to point and from there it goes to the other side right so that's how that's how basically your phase 1 works okay so next we'll talk about phase 2 so phase 2 let me grab my pen so phase 2 I think you are probably already expecting this apart from you know tunnels being established between the spokes and the hub you will also end up seeing tunnels between spokes also right it won't be tunnels just between spokes and the hub rather you will also have direct tunnels spoke to spoke tunnels which means you can you no longer have to send all the traffic up to the hub rather you can also exchange it directly on this spoke to spoke tunnels how that really happens we'll see that in a minute okay so now that you have a little bit of context around how phase 2 is different from phase 1 right at least from a tunnel creation perspective let's talk about how it really works for, there are two main prerequisites for this phase 2 to work properly what are those one is the spoke routers right in this case these are your spoke routers they need to have a route for the network that they are trying to reach so in this case say r6 is one network right and say this switch to wants to talk to this R6 network. So this R4 which is setting, sitting here should have this network, the R6 network in its self table, right? Should It should have learned this route, right? Obviously, when the phase two comes up initially, only these two tunnels will exist. The spoke to spoke tunnel will not exist, right? So initially only these two tunnels will exist. So along this tunnel, it should have learned because we'll have OSPF running here. So that route would have come to switch R1 and from R1 it would have been relayed down to R4, right? So the spokes need, let me just call it as spoke networks, but you understand the point, right? The spokes should, should basically learn about the networks to which they intend to talk to. So it, it should be there in the Ceph table. If that is not there, then the subsequent steps will not be initiated right so that's step number one other prerequisite is next hop preservation of next hop which means what is the next hop when uh, I mean when so we have OSPF running here isn't it so we have OSPF running the IPv6 OSPF running here between R1 R4 and R5 so when this network which is behind R5 goes 
you know, say along this tunnel, even the uh, adjacency is established and the network comes at R1, what is going to be the next hop for this R6 network? It is going to be R5. Now, R1, which is sitting here, should not disturb that next hop. It should relay the information as is downstream to the other spoke. Right? So, preservation of next hop is very important. Right? So, these two steps are, or these two are, kind of prerequisites for your phase 2 to work properly. And I will tell you why. Right? We will look into that. There is something very interesting which happens behind the doors. And, you know, kind of um, understanding that is like the crust of understanding phase 2. Okay. Okay. So, let me just erase this part because I have to write something here. So, like I was telling, right, these two points, these two are like the prerequisites for the phase 2 to work. So, let's try to retrace this. Let's pick the same network which we were talking, the R6 network. And because of this tunnel between, you know, R5 and R6, which has just come up when the phase 2 was initiated, the route basically came to R1 and R1 hasn't disturbed the next stop or the network and it has sent it nicely down to R4. And because of this, what will happen is a Ceph entry, you know, Ceph table, Cisco Express forwarding, right? It's basically nothing but a, think of it as a, um, uh, like a small, uh, you know, it's basically nothing but your forward information base, which is on the line card of a router, which helps you to kind of forward the packets without sending it back to the CPU, right? So Cisco Express forwarding. So because, because this route has been received by R4, there will be an entry for that route, right? For this R6's route, whatever this route is, there will be an entry in the CEP table, okay? So there will be an entry and, but then it will appear as invalid, right? So let me use a different color here. So it will appear as invalid. Basically, it will the entry will be there, but it will appear as invalid. Reason? Because this route was learnt via the tunnel. Okay? And the next hop for this route, right? Even actually, if you look at it, even that will also have a safe entry. Right? There will be another safe entry for what? The next hop of that particular route. I mean, any route will have a next stop, right? Like, for example, take this... Um, this network which you have, you can call it as prefix, network, route, whatever. So generally when you look at a routing table, what it is going to have? It is going to have a route and how to reach that route, there will be a next hop. Correct? So when you look at the Ceph um, resolution or if you look at the Ceph table for this route, it will show as invalid. The reason is because the next hop is not really reachable, right? The next hop will be basically the tunnel IP address of this R5 and as of now, R6 doesn't really know how to get there, right? So as of now, the R4 doesn't really understand that IP address. So it will be invalid. So you can double check that by doing show IP safe of this next hop as well, right? And it will show us, it, it will tell the router that, look, yes, it is, it is probably an IP address of another, you know, it's probably an IP address of the tunnel, a tunnel which you are also part of. But currently, I don't know that information. I don't know how to reach that tunnel, right? So, but then having this entry in the Ceph table is very critical for the phase two to work, right? And this entry, this Ceph entry, is installed in the on the router only when this requirement is met. That is, the networks which behind the spokes, right? It should be every spoke should have a route to the network that they wish to talk to right so only when the network is advertised through something like a routing protocol like say OSP of EIJP or whatever only then the route will arrive at R4 and only then the Ceph entry will be installed right now why, why do we need this Ceph entry the very next step is when I don't have when, when my Ceph table or the Ceph uh, information is incomplete, what the router does is, it will punt that packet to the CPU. Okay, So that's where you sometimes would have heard about this term called as process switching. Right? So process switching is like a counterpart to Ceph, 
surface Cisco Express forwarding, which is, you know, it doesn't really fund the traffic back to the CPU, to the supervisor or whatever, right? It will directly forward the packet and it's super fast, whereas process switching is super slow because the packet has to be punted to the CPU and that takes a lot of time, you know, and uh, uh, it's quite slower. But there is no other option for me, right? My self is telling, look, I don't know. I don't know how to create this tunnel. So I really need, need to punt this traffic to the CPU and that's where the process switching comes into play. So the first packet which will be sent, right? Say which has come from switch 4, which has reached R4. R4 doesn't really know what to do with it because the Ceph is incomplete. So the first packet is routed using process switching across the hub, right? So for this packet, what will be, what will happen is that whole NHRP process will kick in. The router is gonna say, since we have incomplete Ceph, I'm gonna ask my NHRP server for more information. So that's how that NHRP, you know, request, resolution request will be sent up to the hub. The hub is going to look at its cache and it would have received this registration from R5 as well, right? So it is going to say, ah, okay, the network which you're trying to reach, right? And uh, sorry, in this case, uh, it is basically going, the next stop resolution request will be nothing but trying to ask how to reach R5, right? Because that next stop IP is already available here. We just need to know how to reach it, which means I just need to know the public IP of the tunnel so that I can form the tunnel. So that information, when you do a resolution request, the NHS, which is here, will reply back, right? Will reply saying, okay, this is the public IP and this is how you can form the tunnel. So once I receive that information, I can then create a tunnel of my own with R5 and yeah, we are good, right? Once I have the tunnel set up, then I can basically send the traffic up there. So the first packet will be process switching. That is one thing which is very important to understand in phase two. Okay, so we had just to recap, we had two important things. One is we had to have all the networks, right? The spoke should know every single network, right? So as a result, you can't do some kind of summarization and stuff, right? That's probably like a drawback of again phase two because you will end up having big routing tables. Right, because without having that, without having learned that network, your Ceph table will not have that entry. If the Ceph table is not having that entry, your Ceph table, that, that packet will never be punted to the CPU. The process switching will never kick in. As a result, that whole NHRP resolution request, nothing will kick in. So the very first, the starting point of this story is that you need to have that Ceph table, right, or the Ceph, uh, that entry installed in the Ceph and that is only possible if the network is the spoke has learned about this other network. The other thing is this next stop is super important right for that network for let's say for R6 network the next stop should be R5 the tunnel IP of R5 right no one should change it if someone changes it in the middle then we are again screwed right because R4 here is completely depending on this information, the next stop information to form the tunnel. Okay, that next stop resolution request which goes through, it is basically going through for this next stop. It is basically R4 is literally asking R1, look, I want to reach this network R6 and I have the next stop information also, which is R5. Can you please give me the public IP mapping of that R5, right? So the next stop is very important. If the next stop is changed, then R4 will end up creating tunnels to something else, right? Which exactly will not work for us. So there are, again, it, so the, the importance of routing, right? There's huge amount of importance of routing here. There are some protocols like EIJRP protocol, which will change the next stop. So when the traffic comes, when the route comes from R5 to R1 and from R1 to R4, the R1 will change the next stop right in EIJRP so we have to explicitly change that behavior on R1 we have to say no next stop self but in OSPF that is not the case because OSPF is a link state protocol it will not change anything it will just relay the networks because in link state protocol every router has the 
same visibility complete information about the area right cool so i think that was you know helpful that was phase two right these are the two important things you need to keep in mind the two uh, kind of like prerequisites and also remember that the first packet will be process switched because the first packet will need this whole nhrp resolution to go up nhrp reply to come and only then i can form the tunnel right so we saw there are few drawbacks of this phase two and let's see how phase three really solves this all right so phase three let me actually keep the phase two here because it will be helpful for us to compare let me write phase three over here okay so with phase three what is going to happen in phase three the spoke routers really don't need this one these two requirements are not needed right let me just get that out of the way right in phase two these two requirements are needed but in phase three they are not which means if r4 wants to talk to say this network i really don't need to have a very specific entry in my ceph table uh, you know which was very much needed for my phase two to work right so that is one thing and the next stop i don't really care about what the next stop is in case of phase three right so these both um, you know requirements are gone when it comes to the tunnels yes your uh, you know your uh, uh, spokes will be able to create tunnels with the hub as well as with the with themselves as well right that was i think obviously understood right it's that that behavior hasn't changed that will still remain as compared to phase 2 only in phase 1 spoke to spoke tunnels can't be formed in phase 2 and phase 3 spoke to spoke tunnels can be formed okay so how does this really work in phase 3 so now that we don't have those two prerequisites how does it all fall, fall into place and why it is better than phase 2 all right so step number 1 would be very similar to what we have seen in the in both the earlier phases the whole nhrp will kick in right which is all about dynamically discovering your spokes and learning all that information about the scopes uh, spokes right that's going to happen so here in our case uh, this this particular tunnel and there is a tunnel here so r4 and r5 they, when they come up they go and register that information with the uh, with the hub r1 right and they are basically going to go and register their tunnel ip and uh, the basically the private and public ip right actually uh, the public IP is not actually called as public IP, it's called NBMA address, right? But for our reference, we have been just calling it as private and public, right? Anyway, so that information about the tunnel, right? The private public on from both the spokes is sent up and registered at the hub. After that, what is going to happen? The um, OSPF or the routing protocol adjacency comes up. In our case, we are running OSPF, could be any other protocol. So the routing adjacency comes up and the routing information from the spokes is also sent up to the hub. Now the fun thing here is the very first point, like I said, the spoke networks need not learn all the other networks for all the other spokes, right? So in case of phase three, the hub can be configured to kind of send one some kind of a default route or summarize it, right? If you have so many spokes, then you can probably take all the you know address from all the spokes and you can summarize this and send it down right or you can even put a you can go to the go as far as kind of like creating a default route on r1 and showing it or uh, you know sending it downstream to the spokes right you can get that much of scalability right you and that's one of the big advantage of phase 3 you will no longer have big routing tables like you had in phase 2 because the very first criteria which we saw here that is removed okay so what we have done till now we have gotten the whole dynamic learning of the tunnels right using the whole nhrp process the routing adjacency has come up the route the routes have been exchanged to the hub and the hub either has sent one summarized default route right or it has probably sent the exact same routes if you have not done any configuration any additional configuration but whatever it is the spokes would have received the routing information right so they will go and populate it populate the routing and the ceph tables now the difference here is that the ceph entries over here right it will not be invalid like it was in phase 2 right in phase 2 that was one of the main reason for the whole subsequent steps to be 
you know triggered but in this case all the ceph entries will be pointing to the hub right so all the in phase 3 all the ceph entries for all the routes right which which r4 or r5 receives it will be pointing to the ip address of the hub right and hub i and you already have a tunnel to the hub you already have adjacency to it so you know all the ceph entries will be valid it won't be in, invalid okay now this is very interesting here because the ceph entries are valid right the whole nhrp process nhrp resolution which was getting triggered in phase 2 will not get triggered here right so that's the very first difference right <coughs> so what i also want to kind of bring out here is in phase 2 your hub or yeah your hub basically right or nhs next stop server whatever right hub was kind of like the king of information it had all the information and you had to reach to the hub for any kind of nhrp resolution but in case of phase 3 it is more kind of like distributed which means the hub is not the only one who can you know who who has power rather the spokes can kind of like generate or create this nhrp requests and answer them as well right it's not the hub alone and i'll kind of try to explain that in a better way in a minute okay so where we are so our ceph entries are valid uh, and all of them are pointing to the hub okay and uh, <coughs> so because the ceph entries are valid when the first packet comes from where from the switch to destined to this r6 when it reaches r4 it is going to look in r4 and in r4 probably there is going to be some kind of a default route or summarized route right and because of that the ceph is a valid ceph so the packet is sent where to towards the hub so the first packet is always sent towards the hub but the difference is the first packet is always ceph forwarded see the difference here in case of phase 2 the first packet was always process switched but in case of phase 3 because your ceph is valid it is pointing to hub the first packet is cisco express forwarded ceph which is way way faster than process switching right that's there you go that's a very important difference now once the packet um, is forwarded to the hub the hub is obviously going to look in its routing table and it will figure out that okay this this is destined to r6 right and as a result i'll have to send it down to r5 okay so <clears throat> that is going to happen but there are two interesting keywords which you will kind of hear repeatedly when you talk about phase 3 one is your redirect and the other one is shortcut very funny words to hear in a you know routing scenario or you know um, you know technical discussion i guess but anyway so you have two words one is the nhrp redirect other one is your nhrp shortcut okay so the redirect will be configured on your hub and the shortcut will be configured on the spokes okay i know it's probably a little too much to grasp but you know stay with me here so your um, uh, the mgre tunnel on the hub right it will be configured with the redirect so what is going to happen is when this packet which was set forward it is reaching r1 and r1 is going to look at that packet and it's going to say okay i have received a packet on my tunnel and i'm going to be forwarding that packet down on the same tunnel because at the end of the day though i have put two arrow marks here this is just one tunnel right it's just one single mgre tunnel a uh, one tunnel which has multiple you know think of it as multiple faces or something right it's just one single tunnel so the hub which is sitting here will be will go like okay look i'm getting this packet into my tunnel and i'm sending it out of the same tunnel so there must be some better way to reach this destination without coming to me right so as a result your r1 sitting here will send what we call as a redirect message you know a read nhrp redirect right this one it's going to send the nhrp redirect downwards towards your spokes and in that uh, redirect message it is also going to send the original destination to which it forwarded that earlier packet right so the first packet is self switched and it will always go to the hub the first packet right so it will go up and it is going to reach r5 
right but that nhrp redirect which will be sent down to r4 will have that information now that r4 has received this nhrp redirect what it will do is it will basically create a nhrp resolution right and it is going to take that information which it has received from the hub and it is try it will try to reach out to this r5 saying that look r1 is telling me that i can reach to you directly instead of going through the hub so can we do this right so it is going to send a resolution request and the resolution response is going to be obtained right r5 is going to reply back saying yes uh, i mean uh, you are trying to reach to a network behind me so yeah you don't have really have to go through r1 you can come to me directly right so that is all part of this nhrp shortcut okay so the redirect was done by the uh, the redirect message came from the hub and your spokes basically ended up using the nhrp shortcut it's nothing but it is going to create nhrp resolution request and the other spoke is going to reply and we have the new tunnel set up so from now on when r4 wants to talk to something behind r5 it's going to use this tunnel rather than going through the hub that's that's literally what it is to it when you talk about phase 3 but you see the cool differences here right one thing is you don't really need big routing tables as we did in phase 2 because in phase 2 you really needed all the spokes to have all the networks which it intends to talk to right else the ceph entry will not be installed but in case of this one not really needed i just need one default route to r1 or the hub for that first packet to be ceph forwarded once that packet goes through r1 r1 will anyway send me that redirection and i will you know go about my business so i just need one default route to my hub the very first time that's it second thing is the hub is no longer the only source or basically the hub is not the only source of only source of nhrp information right what we really ended up doing is here the nhrp resolution request was finally created by r4 and it was replied by r5 right we really did not have to bother r1 to give us more information he just sent us the redirect but we took care of the whole resolution and the request right so what i mean to say is the spokes are much more intelligent when compared to you know phase 2 the last one is obviously very evident here the very first packet in phase 2 was process switched but in case of phase 3 it will be self switched okay so hope that was useful guys i mean i, I thought i'd just do this in few minutes but looks like it took quite some time but i just wanted to get all these points out there because the configuration is pretty simple right when you do the configuration of phase 1 versus phase 2 phase 3 it's pretty simple you just need to change a few keywords here and there but it's very important to understand how these three phases work right phase 1 again just to summarize phase 1 no spoke to spoke tunnels and everything goes through the hub you just have point to point tunnels from your spoke so everything has to go through the hub and you can probably get away with like very simple routing probably putting a default route because anyway everything has to go through hub phase 2 you really need these two prerequisites else nothing is going to work your spoke networks should be visible on all the other spokes and the next stop should be preserved right so when the routes reach r1 the r1 has to relay that route without changing the next stop because both of these points have huge influence on the subsequent steps which is installing the ceph entry generating that nhrp resolution the nhrp resolution being answered by the hub right and then the spoke tunnel is going to be generated and the first packet will always be process switched and yeah the first packet will always be process switched correct <clears throat> and uh, uh, the in case of phase 3 the difference is uh, we are going to have uh, the whole idea of nhrp redirect and shortcut which means the first packet will be sent to hub just like phase 2 but only difference here is it is going to be self forwarded instead of process switch and the first packet goes through hub and we get a nhrp redirect and then we go uh, go about doing our own resolution and reply and we don't bother the hub much in case of phase 3 so i'm going to take a pause quickly and then let's get to the configuration all right so let's get to some quick configurations here like i said we've got the whole uh, uh, underlay setup right let me show you probably configuration on maybe one of them so let's go to r1 
here we go show cdp neighbors uh, r1 is connecting to r2 over ethernet 0 slash 2 show run interface ethernet 0 slash 2 right there you go so we have a very basic ospf1 area setup this is ipv4 ospf right so the same thing has been set up between r1 r2 r2 and r3 r3 r4 and r3 r5 right so complete ospf here so if you look at the routing table show ip route ospf you get the complete network so the above these are your loopbacks of each of the routers we probably are not using them for now at least for this exercise and there you go all the direct connected physical links routes are available what about the ipv6 routing so between r1 and switch 1 r4 and switch 2 and r5 and uh, r5 and r6 we have those ipv6 so we can probably go to switch 1 just to see maybe where is switch 1 here you go so let's see uh, what is the interface show cdp neighbors okay so we are connected to r1 over ethernet 0 slash 0 show run interface ethernet 0 slash 0 it's in vlan okay 71 so show run interface vlan 71 there we go we have ospf enabled in addition to that we also have loopback 0 and we also have loopback 1 right so the two loopback networks one is a uh, when I mean, we are concerned mainly with v6 so one loopback 0 is a slash 128 whereas loopback 1 is slash 1 uh, slash 64 and the same format kind of continues on switch 2 and r6 as well similarly on the r1 side if you see uh, there is r1 again it's come here so r1 yeah there you go show cdp neighbors and r1 you see this is the interface it is connected to switch 1 and we have got the we have enabled it in that v6 ospf okay pretty simple nothing very complicated right so let's go about configuring this uh, dmvpn now so we'll start with tunnel 0 on r1 this is our hub and we are doing phase 1 okay so we'll put in an ipv6 address right uh, what is the ipv6 let's put in a link local first fe80 uh, colon colon 1 link local Okay, invalid link local. Okay, my bad. So it is supposed to be FE. There should not be a colon here. Right, there you go. So that should be fine. Let's put IPv6 global address 2001 colon DB8 colon 100 colon 200 colon colon 1 slash 64. Then we have IPv6. Uh, what else? Let's do some of this NHRP stuff. First thing is we'll have to, because it's a hub, right? There won't be much NHRP conflicts. Uh, I mean, uh, I use the word hub and next stop server NHS interchangeably, but uh, I actually meant NHS, right? So IPv6, first is NHRP, you need to put some ID. So network ID, which is say one. You can create multiple overlays. We are just going to have one for our case. Then we need to also have IPv6 NHRP multicast dynamic so we have nhrp map multicast and dynamic what does it actually do so whenever you get a multicast packet directed to the nhrp server or to the hub we are basically telling it to send it downstream to all the spokes right and we are telling dynamic because we really don't know the addresses of the spokes, right? We are intending to learn that through NHRP, right? So right now we don't know the addresses, that's why we are telling dynamic. So we are telling the server, look, grab all the addresses of the spokes and send any multicast packets which you get to all the other spokes. If you get it from one spoke, send it to other guys. So that's what that does. So we have just a couple of commands for NHRP. Um, I think we are good. Uh, oh, we have to enable your uh, tunnel, right? So we'll for every tunnel you need to have a tunnel source. So there you go, tunnel source. And I believe the address, uh, the interface towards R2 is Ethernet 0 slash 2. So that's going to be our tunnel source. I mean, you can even put uh, tunnel source as a loopback address. But I'm going to use a physical address, physical interface here. And the tunnel mode. 
right remember i talked about this in phase one the tunnel mode on the hub is mgre so it's going to be tunnel mode gre multipoint and uh, the next is we need to enable ospf on this tunnel correct so we'll say ip ospf 1 sorry ip ospf 1 which area area 0 until ip is oh uh, sorry uh, i meant to say ip v6 right we don't want v4 ospf we want v6 ospf because the tunnel is v6 <coughs> okay so we have ip v6 ospf 1 area 0 that uh, if you want to do dmvpn but with completely ipv4 the only difference would be the address here i have given ipv6 address for the tunnel if you want to do ipv4 you will need to give some kind of a ip v4 address that's the only difference right anyway so we have enabled ospf1 and let's also this is a very important point right ospf has different types of network types right this is again basic ospf there is point to point ospf there is point to multi point there is broadcast right uh, so yeah there are different types and different types of ospf behaves differently um, in fact i think ip ospf the network uh, the point to point type will not even work with dmvpn right because you have mgre tunnel here right so uh, basically what i mean to say is different network types of ospf behave differently with dmvpn right the one which is i think majorly favored is ip ospf network broadcast assuming you have you know uh, broadcast working in your network right i mean assuming you have uh, your network to be a broadcast network right uh, basically you know how ospf behaves in broadcast right you have that whole dr election and vdr election and all of that so if that is working fine then this this would be a good network type for you or you can investigate other network types like point to multi point and stuff cool that being said let's look so show run interface tunnel zero that's really what we put in right so we've got uh, i think we really don't want this so i think we put it by mistake so let me get rid of that So we don't want that guy. That's IPv4 OSPF. Okay. So we've got the addresses in. We've got the NHRP commands. We've got the OSPF commands, and we have enabled the tunnel. Okay. So that's on R1. Let's get to the other two spokes, which is R4. Let me do this a little quickly. Tunnel zero, right? Um, and your IPv6 address is going to be FE80 colon colon four link local right and then the other address is going to be uh, 2001 colon db8 colon 100 colon 200 uh what else colon colon 4 i guess correct slash 64 should do it uh mistake okay 4 slash 64 <clears throat> and once you're done with that we can do the nhrp part ip nhrp network id is going to be 1 the let's do the multicast part ip nhrp multicast oh sorry map multicast uh it's going to be nothing but you need to point it so on 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 the spoke we need to point the multicast packets to be directed towards the hub on the hub we need to mention it as dynamic but in case of the spokes we will point it to the hub because the IP address of the hub is going to be static, right? And we already know it because we need to, for the NHRP to work, the IP address of the hub should be static because we have to point all the registrations and all of that to the hub, right? So that can't be dynamically learned. That has to be static. So I'm going to say 173.1. I think 12.1. That is my hub. Uh, did I make a mistake? Yes, I did. So. Yeah, there you go. So we've got a couple of NHRP commands. Now we also need to mention the, uh, oh, what did I do? What did I do? Ah, oh, looks like I made a mistake. Let's see on IPv6. Okay, this was correct. I made a mistake by enabling NHRP on IPv6. I'm supposed to do that on IPv4. Okay, so let's fix that. I think, let's say no to that. 
let's do a note to this as well okay so I do want to run this command but I want to run this on IPv6 right because we are enabling uh, the whole thing NHRP for IPv6 because we want to exchange IPv6 on these tunnels okay cool so you have IPv6 NHRP ID then we gonna go with the next command which we already put in but change IPv6 uh, you know NHRP uh, map multicast is going to be pointing to the uh, hub next is we need uh, we need to explicitly you know mention uh, what we need to mention the NHS next stop server so IPv6 this con this command was obviously not needed on the R1 right here you have to do it so and what is it going to be it's nothing but 2000 this thing but we'll just replace 4 with 1 that's it and currently this R4 doesn't really know how to reach this guy so we need to show put in the mapping as well so we'll say IP NHRP map okay another mistake map and we're gonna put this guy right and we're gonna tell how do you reach him I think we'll have to put the subnet also here slash 64 and how do you reach them you reach using this address 173.1.12.1 .1 okay so I think we are good with all the NHRP stuff okay we can do tunnel uh, source which is gonna be um, I don't know let's check uh, let's lo look at the topology where is my R4 tunnel source will be ethernet 0 slash 1 right tunnel source ethernet 0 slash 1 and what is going to be tunnel destination so because it is phase 1 the tunnel mode is not GRE multipoint it is normal GRE point to point GRE so we don't really need to mention the mode also we need to explicitly mention the destination which is 173 1 12.1 right you can go back to my theory discussion earlier to understand this it is point to point tunnels on the spokes for phase 1 and obviously the OSPF has to be enabled IPv6 OSPF 1 area 0 um, and we will also make this guy IPv6 uh, OSPF priority to be 0 because I don't I want the hub to be kind of like the DR and BDR I don't want this guy to be the DR and BDR okay spokes so I want hub to be the main guy with respect to OSPF so yeah I'm just ready making the priority as 0 and the network type IPv6 OSPF network would be I'll go with my broadcast because I've enabled the same so that's it so if I do show run interface tunnel 0 let's see what we have so we've got the addresses in we've got the NHRP commands we've got the OSPF commands and this is that okay so let's go and put the same commands almost the same so let's actually grab that right and let's go to where is that okay so here that's r5 enable quantity right i'm gonna okay so i'm gonna paste it here okay so it's gonna be tunnel zero we need to just change this uh, to five and let's change this to five right because the ip address is different right we need to just change that uh, the link local and that changes the rest everything would be same correct can I pull this a bit off yeah I can so the link local is same the uh, sorry the link local and the global address will change the NHRP stuff would remain the same no changes there OSPF would remain the same I think maybe the tunnel might be different so if you look at R5 it is Ethernet 0 slash 2 so that's the source address let's change that and yeah that's fine that's fine so that's probably cut it from there and paste it directly here okay so that's my r5 guys there you go i can see the tunnel coming up and if uh, if you have done everything right we should be able to do what we should be able to talk between switch to an r6 let's quickly go and see what is there on r6 the ip address which we need to ping there you go that's my r6 
Okay, my asterisk is not coming up. Let's do that again. Okay, there we go. So let's see, show IPv6 interface brief. And we've got loopback 0 and loopback 1. Show run interface loopback 0 and we have loopback 1. Okay. So which one do we want to try? We want to try this guy. Okay, we could pick that one. And from where are we going to ping? We are going to ping from switch 2. From switch 2, we are pinging R6. So come to switch 2. Right, instead of pinging, let's do straight right from the back. There we go. Right? <clears throat> what is happening? We are able to reach at the same time. Because there is phase 1, the traffic is going from R4 to R1 then to R5 and then to the destination. You can do this any number of times, but the result is going to be the same. Let me pause the video and grab the capture as well for a minute. All right, so I've got the capture. I'm capturing it on this interface, Ethernet 0 slash 1. So there you go, that's the capture. Let's again go back and do that trace order. Let's do a ping this time. Okay, there you go. So this is the ping, let's pick one packet and you can see this is the ping, the v6 ping. The inner packet has the v6 address but it is encapsulated by GRE and on the outside you can see the packet is going from R4 to R1. Right, because there is no spoke to spoke tunnels. All the traffic will go through the hub. So you can see the uh, you know packet capture here showing that as well. The packet is going from R4 to R1 and from R1 it then will go to R4. Right? But the, the IPv6 source and destination, you can see here it is perfect. It is going from uh, what is my source switch to to destination which is R6. Okay? So let me go back, pause it. Alright. So we are going to phase 2 now. So for that let's come back to uh, so the for phase 2 there is no change in configuration on the hub. So let's do the changes only on the R4. Show run now. Uh, uh, oh, before that probably we can also check uh, maybe a couple of commands before we go to phase 2. If I, I hope I remember them. They are nothing but show DMVPN. Yeah, there you go, right? So you can see the two tunnels on the R1 side. But on the uh, spokes, see you'll see only one single tunnel. Right, because it is point to point. Okay, cool. Now for phase two, let's see what we have. Show run interface tunnel zero. We just need to remove this tunnel destination and change the mode to GRE multipoint. That's it. Right, rest everything is fine. So let's come here. Let's go here. Let's put tunnel zero. Maybe let's do one thing. Let's shut the tunnels because sometimes you know DMVPN doesn't really like if I play around with the tunnel. So let's go and say tunnel 0. First let's shut it on the spokes. Let's do the same thing on here R5. Then let's shut it on hub. Okay. Let's go about doing our configuration changes. Like I said I gotta remove this one. There you go. Done. Actually let's remove that same on both the sides. Right. There you go. So on R4 and R5, I removed the destination. And I need to mention tunnel mode GRE multipoint. Okay. There you go. Let's go and put that on R4 as well. Cool. Just for your reference, show on interface tunnel 0. Okay. So this is what we have. Everything is same except we just made this guy as tunnel mode GRE multipoint. Okay, now let's see. So we'll have to just go and enable this, right? So first let's um, always bring the spoke up. Let's do a no shot on this one and do a no shot on R4 and R5. Okay, so now first the tunnel should come up, then the OSP of adjacency should come up. Let's wait. Takes a few seconds. Great. See, you can see on R1, I can see the adjacency has come up to both R4 and R5. So now we are good to go and do our testing again. The same testing. We are going to ping from switch 2 to R6. Let's see how that behaves. So let's do a trace maybe, right? 
so we've got a trace running here and the very first trace obviously took four uh, you know uh, four hops because it went to from R4 it went to R1 which is the hub very much in line with what I was talking about earlier right we have that process switching happening uh, for the first packet for the subsequent packets there we go it's no longer because this spoke to spoke tunnel has been built as a result it is directly going from R4 to R5 and not going to the NHS or the hub we can actually check that here do show DM VPN right there you go so we have those spoke to spoke tunnels getting created see this is the tunnel going from R5 to R4 okay as usual I had the packet capture running so maybe I can show you that can I just grab it here yeah so the very first trace out when I did it obviously went to the hub right so the very first one went to the hub and I mean 8 to 6 but if you see here it's going from 4 to 1 right that was the very first packet uh, then what happened see after that okay uh, then you have from 1 to 4 this is uh, the reply coming in let's look at the next packet I think that's the next one I think this is the next one uh, okay give me one second we are looking at the wrong packets I guess give me one second yeah so looks like the uh, NHRP resolution actually went after that you can see here so the resolution uh, request has gone from R4 to R1 right and uh, we can see the information here maybe yeah I think it should be so you can see this is how NHRP uh, resolution request packet looks like uh, let's try to find where is that uh, so this is basically R4 asking R1 look I want to talk to R5 can you give me the uh, mapping right so that should be somewhere down here I think it's probably uh, there should be a client field maybe it's part of this one is that the mandatory part oh yeah okay client entry and in the client address the client sub address okay give me one sec let me just find it kind of difficult to see when I'm recording it all right there you go right so the second packet which is basically coming from R5 to R4 as a it's nothing but the NHRP resolution reply so if you go down here you'll find in the client NBMA address we are basically getting the information about R5 so R5 is telling look this is the IP you can reach out to me if you want to send the packet to networks behind me right so after that you know once that information is obtained you can see the subsequent uh, uh, trace out when we did you can see the packet has directly gone from R4 to R5 because of the direct spoke to spoke tunnels right you can see that here correct cool okay let's do the last one which is phase 3 okay let's follow the same ethics which we followed earlier let's go and shut let's actually shut the spoke uh, let's shut the spokes first you know maybe shut this guy let's shut r5 then let's go and shut the uh, hub as well now what changes do we need here do show run interface tunnel zero so we need changes on the hub as well Correct. What changes do we need? We need to basically enable IPv6 NHRP redirect. So that's the thing we need to enable on the hub. Whereas on on the spokes, what we need to do? Let's see. So let's see what we have. Do show run interface tunnel zero. So we've got the addresses. We've got the multicast in, which is fine. Uh, all the LHRP commands are fine. OSPF is good. Uh, we can actually, okay, fine, that's fine. Uh, yeah, so only thing which we need is the NHRP shortcut. Correct? So we need to just say IP NH, IPv6, IPv6 NHRP shortcut. Okay, the same thing would go on R5 as well. Here, there you go. 
Cool. We need to do a no shut. Let's do no shut on your R1 first, then R5, and then R6. Okay. Let's wait for the tunnel and the OSPF to come up. All right. Looks like the OSPF has come up. You can see both the OSPF nearby uh, ships on both the spokes have come up, which means it's time to test. Let's go back to switch 2. Let's trace it again. As per our understanding, it should replicate the same behavior. That is, the first packet should still go through what? The, uh, it should still go through your hub. Right? So, only after that, the redirect will come and then the shortcut will get triggered. So, there you go. The first packet went. Right? And let's do the second. There you go. Right? Because now we have the tunnels up. So, you can see it is... It is no longer going to R1 or the hub, rather it is going directly, right? Awesome. Alright, the packet capture as well for the same exercise. You can see here on the top, we've got the packets we started and R1 immediately sent the, you know, redirect over here towards R4. And then we have the NHRP resolution going from 4 to 1. Uh, and then you have a reply coming from 5 to 4, right? Uh, and there you go, right? The reply coming from, and then there is a resolution request coming from 5 to 4, and 4 is uh, again sending another resolution from 4 to 5, and then you have the replies, right? So both the spokes are uh, sending the NHRP resolutions to each other, and grab, and both of them are answering each other, and that way they are exchanging all the prefixes they have with each other, so that you know in future any packet which is destined to any of the spoke networks can directly be exchanged and that should be visible on the tunnels as well so if you go to probably one of these guys hope the tunnels have not timed out if you do show dmvpn you should see yeah five so i mean it's showing for different uh, tunnels so you have this is on r4 so you have the tunnels going for both uh, r1 as well as to r5 for different prefixes right so that's uh, mainly it guys I mean I just wanted to kind of I, I mean I thought this is gonna be a quick video but it looks like uh, there's a lot to cover but hope you guys liked it have a good one bye